In this video, we'll be talking about one fundamental concept in developmental biology. This is about induction and competence. So let us try to understand with examples, what does induction and competence mean? So what is really induction? Induction refers to the process by which one group of cell influence the development of another group of nearby cells. So here you can see the cells which were red influence the nearby cells and thus they become and acquire different cellular fates. This is the process of induction. And most of the cases induction happens via secreted signals. Morphogen gradients are involved. If you like to work, uh, watch the video on morphogen gradient, it's in the I button. Question is, which cellular behaviors could be influenced by the process of induction? It turns out many aspects. For example, the cell-cell adhesion, the cell migration, cell division, and differentiation to a specific uh, fate, all of these can be influenced by the process of induction. That's why it's so important in context of development. One of the best example that we can take comes from the Xenopus eye development. So here is a Xenopus tadpole. Now we are going to cut a horizontal section and it would look like this. So you can see there are two places which look like eyes and the innermost part of that is basically optic vesicle. Optic vesicle is basically the inducer of the lens development. Now when the optic vesicles are present in proper location, lens is induced. And it is important for lens induction comes from the experiment where optic vesicle is removed, lens is never induced. Now if the optic vesicle is present underlying a non-competent ectoderm which doesn't have the capability to follow the instruction provided by the optic vesicle lens is never induced also putting a random tissue other than optic vesicle underneath a competent mesoderm competent ectoderm does not produce lens that tells us indeed that the right time and the right thing has to match it's like a two-way key here there should be a component which is the competent responder another component is the inducer and this two component has to talk to each other simultaneously and we can see that because in an incompetent responder cannot follow the signals provided by the inducer and that does not lead to the fate which was supposed to be acquired so we can imagine this to be a two-way lock you need two keys to open up this lock and if you have only one key, not the other, then there would be an error and the key and the lock would never be opened. Okay, now let's take about, talk about the sequence of amphibian lens development and lens uh, induction in a bit more details. So all starts in the mid gastrula stage where there is a presumptive lens ectoderm which is destined to become the lens in future. Here you can see the mesoderm in red, endoderm in yellow, and ectoderm in uh, light green. So eventually, in the late gastrula state, there are specific competence factors which starts appearing in the presumptive lens ectoderm. And by the early neurula stage, OTX2, PAC6, all of these competence factors are highly expressed and defining this basically presumptive lens ectoderm. And it turns out these molecular factors work like a licensing key for these ectoderm to become eventually a lens. So the question is, what are these inductive cues? What are these messages that the optic vesicle actually provides to the ectoderm such that it can become the future lens? So what is the molecular nature? It turns out several experimentation has found out these molecules are nothing but BMP4 and fibroblast growth factor 8. They bind to the BMP receptor and the fibroblast growth factor receptor in the lens, presumptive lens ectoderm. So what does they do? And they initiate a signaling cascade which lead to production of transcription factors of SOX family, production of transcription factor of LMAF family, etc. But how does that add up? It turns out all these transcription factors work in a network. For example, SOX2, LMAF, PAC6 work in a molecular network to trigger the expression of delta crystalline, which is one of the defining element of the lens. Now, the competence factor here is actually PAC6. This is a transcription factor which makes the 
ectoderm above the optic vesicle competent. And the mouse mutant where PAC6 is not present doesn't have an eye or a lens. And that tells us PAC6 is really important for the eye development. Now here is again the old view just to recap. Here is the surface ectoderm and the optic vesicle underneath. And there are several genetic experiments done beautifully to demonstrate the importance of PAC6 as a competence factor. So when PAC6 was not deleted from either the optic vesicle or the surface ectoderm, lens induction is normal. When selectively PAC6 is gone from the optic vesicle, then what happened is lens induction is again normal. Nothing changes. When the PAC6 is gone from the surface ectoderm right now, then the lens induction doesn't happen. That means PAC6 is super important in context of surface ectoderm. Just as a proof of principle, when PAC6 is gone from both the places, again, lens induction doesn't happen. So all this set of nicely demonstrated genetic experiments shows that PAC6 work like a competence factor. It's like a licensing card that is provided to the surface ectoderm by PAC6 such that it can become lens in future. Now, you must be thinking this is basically a one-way process. It's never a one-way process. This is actually two-way. But before that, let me tell you, PAC6 is important in context of lens induction, regardless of the species. In mammal, flies, frog, mouse, everywhere, PAC6 is really important. And when PAC6 is lost, lens is never induced. Now, here we talk about the concept of reciprocal induction. As we were talking about these signals and crosstalk between cells, we said that it is never one way. It's always a two-way conversation. And this is known as the reciprocal induction. That means the cells which is secreting the signal, that means the inducer, can also get a signal back from the responders. And inducer can be induced as well. One of the great examples comes from the retina development itself. So one can see this is the optic vesicle and the optic vesicle would eventually become the optic cup and the presumptive lens ectoderm would be induced by these optic vesicle once upon a time. But eventually when the, when the lens is starting to form, it also secretes several factors that triggers the optic cup to now acquire different fates. Optic cup eventually becomes the neural retina and the pigmented retina. That tells us between the optic vesicle and the surface ectoderm, there could be two-way signaling crosstalks. So this is known as the reciprocal induction. Now let's talk about some of the important features about uh, inductive interactions. There could be two flavors. One is called instructive interactions. Another is known as the permissive interaction. In instructive interaction, what happens is the signal is often a secreted factor which is provided by the inducer, recepted by the responder. This lead to changes in the responder cell. Responder cell takes a different fate. Pretty simple. But the permissive interaction is a bit different. And it comes from the molecular environment that is surrounding the cell. That means the extracellular matrix. The extra extracellular matrix provide inductive signal and permissive signal to induce a particular fate. In this case, they become fibroblasts. So this is known as permissive interaction. Now there are regional specificity of fit induction. And one of, one of the best experiment has been done in chicks. So in the chick, there are two layers of the skin. One is basically the uh, epidermal epithelium. And another is the mesenchymal uh, lo uh, tissue, which is basically the dermal mesenchyme. Question is, the source of these dermal mesenchyme can trigger different fate acquisition of the epidermal epithelium. So it all boils down to the epithelial and mesenchymal interaction. When grafts of wing dermal mesenchyme was placed under the wing epidermal epithelium, it triggers the formation of wing feather. But when it is taken from the thigh, it becomes a thigh feather. That means the positional information is encoded by these tissues. Also, in an ex experiment where foot uh, mesenchyme was used, claw scales were produced instead of these traditional feathers. So this tells us that induction has a regional specificity in many species. There is another important concept about induction. It doesn't 
uh, really get restricted with the species barrier. And cross species experiment was one of the pioneering in the field. So from the so it, this particular experiment was done with frog glastrula and newt glastrula. So frog one portion of the frog glastrula was transplanted into the newt glastrula, and the researchers are able to show that newt glastrula developed uh, frog tadpole like suckers. Generally, newt glastrula doesn't have this structure, but due to this particular inductive uh, transplantation these suckers were development de developed now the other way around was also true when a portion of newt gastrula was transplanted into frog gastrula the frog started showing newt like balancers the balancer is one of the organ that helps these newt to swim so these balancers are never present in frog but after transplantation these were induced so this tells us that instructions sent by the mesenchymal tissue can cross the species barriers and can induce species specific structures in a completely different species. That is why the overall process of induction and competence is so damn important. Now just to give a quick overview of the points that we covered, inductive interactions involve inducing and the responding tissue inducer and the responder that we talked about the ability to respond towards the inductive signal is known as competence the specific response to an inducer is determined by the genome of the re responding tissue so a lot of gene expression level changes has to happen then there are cascades of inductive events which are responsible for organ formation reciprocal induction gives us an idea of two-way crosstalks and also there are regionally specific in induction cues which can generate different structures from the same responding tissue and we got the example of the chick feather development in this context so i hope this video was useful if you like this video give it a quick thumbs up don't forget to like share and subscribe in our website you can also download these notes and flashcards see you in next video all the links are provided in the description check it out and share it with your friends